There exists within the evangelical Protestant movement of the church today a spiritual stigmatism that is, if one is to be baptized in water for the cleansing of sins, it's translated to mean one is rejecting Jesus' shed blood on the cross once for all, and that this work of man or baptism is something one does to be saved rather than trusting in faith of the finished work of Christ. It is also frequently asserted that whereas works are the result of salvation, they do not play any conditional role in the securing of one's redemption. Well, I will simply state here categorically that there is no truth to these stigmatic beliefs. Faith, repentance, confession, and immersion are all irrefutable conditions clearly set forth by God and His Word prior to the reception of our salvation. Mark 16.16 16 and Acts 2.38 Jesus affirmed that the one who has believed and who has been immersed shall be saved. Mark 16.16 16. The construction of the Greek grammar makes it certain that both belief and baptism precede salvation. The Lord did not suggest that one may be saved in the absence of both faith and baptism, and he did not contend that he who is baptized is saved, and that without faith. He did not state that he who believes is saved and may optionally submit to baptism. The more complete picture involves faith, immersion, and salvation, the whole word of God, as in Matthew 4.4, 4, and in that order. It is utterly incredible that some, professing an acquaintance with the New Testament, deny the role of obedient work in the sacred scheme of redemption. Jesus plainly taught that one must work for that spiritual sustenance which abides unto eternal life, John 6.27, and that even faith itself is a divinely appointed work, John 6.29. Elsewhere, the inspired apostle admonished Christians to be careful that they lose not the things which they had wrought or worked for. 2 John 1 8. Christians have a faith that works. Galatians 5 6. Indeed, they are to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2 12. Abounding in good works. 2 Corinthians 9 8, Ephesians 2 10, and Colossians 1 10 being constantly aware of the fact that they will be judged by their deeds. Matthew 16.27, Romans 2.6, 2 Corinthians 5.10, and 1 Peter 1.17. You might want to go over those and read those. There has been much controversy over the instruction within the book of James regarding faith and works. Clearly, James taught that justification is as much by works as it is by faith. James 2.21 The divine writer unequivocally affirmed that faith without works cannot save. James 2.14 Is he speaking of the alien sinner or the Christian? Well, the question is academic. James is discussing the principle of faithful obedience to whomever it applies, whether an Abraham or a Rahab. The work of faith, John 6, 27-29. In his epistle to the Romans, Apostle Paul thrillingly declares, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6, 23. The expression, free gift, translates the single Greek word charisma. This term is related to the original word that is frequently rendered grace or charis. It thus denotes a gift that is given strictly out of favor. It is not deserved. Here the term is set in contrast to wages or opsonion, which represents deserved payment for services rendered. It is sometimes assumed by well-meaning, though mistaken people, that because salvation is an unmerited gift, there is absolutely nothing to be done in order to obtain remission of sins. 
That is a very far from the truth statement. Jesus himself once said, Not every one that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 7.21 Pardon is conditional. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38 There is a remarkable passage in the Gospel of John that wonderfully illustrates that a gift may be offered and yet conditions may be imposed as a requisite to the reception of that gift. Jesus once instructed, Work not for the food which perishes, but for the food which abides unto eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. John 6.27 Though eternal life is designated as a gift, the Lord emphasizes that there is work or obedience to be done on the human side in order to receive that gift. So, in your Bible, circle work and give and connect them with a line. And note in your margin, gift does not exclude human response. The disciples obviously understood the importance of the Master's admonition, for they asked, what must we do that we may work the works of God? Or the works of God are as he prescribed for us to do. Christ responded, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. 6.29 It is very important to observe that even believing is a work, which must be done by those who aspire to, to heaven. So again, thus, circle work and believe, and note the relationship between these terms. Baptism, a working of God. Colossians 2, verse 12. Many denominational people oppose the idea that baptism is an essential condition for the remission of past sins. One of the misconceptions leading to this erroneous conclusion is this. It is argued that the New Testament plainly teaches that we are not saved by works. But baptism is a work. Therefore, baptism can have nothing to do with our salvation. This is the most fallacious argument that has been stigmatized for hundreds of years since Martin Luther. It is a fact, of course, that the Bible does deny that man is saved by works of human merit, Ephesians 2.9 and Titus 3.5. That does not mean, however, that all works of every kind are excluded from the salvation process. There are, for instance, works which are denominated as works of God, i.e. works which God has prescribed, which are clearly included in the plan of redemption. One of these is believing. Jesus declared, This is the work of God, that you believe on him who he has sent. John 6.29 The expression, work of God, denotes the works required and approved by God. Similarly, baptism is not a work of human merit. Rather, it is an act that has been commanded by God, Acts 10.48, for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38, and the resurrection effected or touched in that ritual, which is unto life, Romans 6.4, is a working of God and not one of human ingenuity. It is crassly deceptive to pervert a divinely given obligation by the Lord's Apostle by suggesting that it is a work of human merit. So, in Colossians 2, verse 12, underline the expression, working of God in your Bible, and record this notation in the margin. Salvation through baptism is a working of God, 
not a work of human merit. Incidentally, this additional comment is appropriate at this time. If baptism is a mere work of human righteousness, then it is excluded from the divine plan of redemption. If such is the case, then those who submit to it, believing that it brings remission of sins, are trusting in a human work rather than the Savior, and thus they cannot be saved. Those who oppose baptism for the remission of sins cannot legitimately claim, we believe that you are wrong on this issue, but nonetheless, we accept you as brothers in Christ. Well, that position is not consistent. Is justification from sin by faith or works? And does it result from either one as opposed to the other or both? One would expect that such a fundamental question could be answered clearly and confidently with a united declaration by those who profess a devout regard for the testimony of the scriptures. Sadly, such is not the case. The more strict disciples of Calvin, for example, contend that there are no conditions at all in the plan of salvation. In 1957, G. E. Griffin, a cleric for the Primitive Baptist Church, affirmed in a debate with Guy N. Woods, and he said, The scriptures teach that the alien sinner comes into possession of spiritual or eternal life without any condition on his, the sinner's part. These folks do not even acknowledge that faith is a condition of salvation. Serrells, a primitive Baptist writer, stated, We believe that there is no warrant whatever for the view that John 1.16 lays down faith as a condition to be performed by the lost person in order to attain spiritual or eternal life. At the opposite extreme, there are those who contend at least by implication that works effect salvation apart from faith. Every group that practices infant baptism must concede that whatever advantage the baptism of the baby is alleged to have, it is not associated with faith, since no infant can personally believe. The Roman Catholic Church even teaches that baptism may be administered to those who are unconscious or even insane. Clearly, some endorse the idea that works save, and that without faith. Then there is the common claim of many Protestants that faith alone saves. The discipline of the Methodist Church states, Wherefore, that we are justified by faith only is a most wholesome doctrine, and very full of comfort. But elsewhere in the same volume, it is argued that the benefits of the atonement are unconditional, a clear contradiction. The doctrine of salvation by faith only is not wholesome, and the comfort is deceptive. Again, Another sectarian body contends that justification is solely through faith in Christ. It is hardly necessary to point out that if salvation is solely through faith, then repentance is excluded from heaven's plan of redemption, if the word solely is assigned its legitimate meaning. On the other hand, the same writer contends that both repentance and faith are inseparable graces wrought in the soul by the regenerating Spirit of God, whereby being deeply convinced of our guilt, danger, and helplessness, and of the way of salvation by Christ, we turn to God. Well, which is it? Is salvation solely by faith? Or are both faith and repentance requisites to turning to God? The statements are not consistent. Martin Luther was so adamant regarding the doctrine of faith only that he smuggled 
the word only into the text of his German translation in Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Linsky, a Lutheran commentator, attempted to defend Luther's addition to the word by suggesting that although the term only is not found in the original text, the sense of it is. Well, this is a clear disobedience of the warning in Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. Shall we conclude that Luther was more adept at rendering the sense than the Apostle Paul was? The spiritual stigmatism mentioned in our opening of this lesson must not be embraced nor propagated in any shape or form. It is a deception the devil uses to lead one astray from the clear and loving commands of the Lord Jesus Christ to be his. I hope you've been blessed by this study.